Ladies and gentlemen, this, the sun is shining here. I hope it's shining where you are, but you're very happily taken an all off and hopefully mm -hmm. it will prove worthwhile. Um, we're looking really at 1922, a key year in Irish history. 1921 may have seen the partition of the island. 1922 sees the emergence of two Irish states amidst great violence, amidst great anarchy, really. And of course, the firming up of a new border, which no one had imagined would be there just a few years before. So, and uh, we're going to talk about the turmoil of this particular year. So um, we're going to look at a number of personalities in the, con in the, in the context of 1922. And there's sort of a bit more detail. We're talking about raids, many of them cross-border raids, reprisals, the question of the Irish boundary from the Clonus Affray, which is in February 22, right through to the Irish Civil War in the summer of 1922. The next slide, please, Sherry. And of course, the Prime Minister at this time is the great survivor, David Lloyd George. But 1922, we'll see the collapse of his coalition, his conservative-dominated coalition, which had actually redrawn the map of Europe as well as actually introduced uh, an act for the partition of Ireland. So his name will be name-checked here quite a bit. The Welsh wizard, um, he would fall in October 1922 and never hold office again. Uh, the next slide, please. And of course, Sinn Féin had been the major political organisation on the island from uh, really 1916 on from the rising. The War of Independence had been fought out between the IRA and Crown forces, reinforced by the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries in 1920. And of course, a truce was introduced in 1921 uh, uh, in July, enabling negotiations to get underway. Uh, this coincided with the partition of Ireland in uh, June 1921. But here we can see two men who were soon to become mortal enemies, Eamon de Valera, the so-called Longfellow, and Michael Collins smiling towards him on the right there, the big fellow, at a match in 1921, oblivious of the fact that within months they would be permanently estranged and within a year they would be locked in a mortal civil war. The next slide, please. The treaty delegates, of course, to the negotiations in London were not led by Eamon de Valera, who sent Arthur Griffith, the father of Sinn Féin, a man who was always prepared to accept the British crown, and Michael Collins, who held great sway with the military man, the architect of the War of Independence. They led this delegation of Sinn Féin uh, plenty of potentiaries, as they were known, to London in the autumn of 1921. Uh, and, of course, they were seeking an all-Ireland republic. Uh, Collins, for one, didn't believe they could achieve that. They were thinking more in terms of um, a Canadian style uh, form of Irish independence, an Irish free state, whether that would be for a united Ireland or a divided Ireland, since partition had already happened and there was a functioning parliament in Belfast remained to be seen. In the end, of course, they would achieve, um, uh, if you like, independence for a 26 county free state, which had to recognise the crown of the empire. And on the question of the north, the border, all they got was a boundary commission, a very vague formula which promised to redraw the border in accordance with the wishes of the inhabitants. But in the end, of course, that would um, uh, unravel very badly from 1922 on, and the old border would be confirmed in 1925. The next slide, please. James Craig and his cabinet, of course, um, were determined to hold on to their territorial uh, territory. You remember that James Craig's slogan in these years was not an inch. He had rejected an offer of the nine county province in 1920, arguing that it wouldn't be viable as a permanent union estate. And instead, he insisted on uh, six counties, many felt for Manor and Tyrone, which had small nationalist majorities, and the city of Derry stroke Londonderry should go into the new free state. And that was the moot point. That was what Collins and his colleagues were trying to reopen in the, in the negotiations. So when Craig and his cabinet learned of the terms of the treaty, on the 6th of December 1921, they were not happy. You can see um, one local politician there, second right as you look at the picture, is Edward M. Archdale, one of the Archdales of Castle Archdale, a mild-mannered aristocrat who had been returned for North Fermanagh in the 1918 election and was now um, a Belfast MP and Minister for Agriculture in the new uh, Northern Ireland government. Ironically, his predecessor, um, 
the Honourable uh, Edward Archdale, um, had been a Protestant home ruler in Fermanagh. So the family were divided, but this man was a very strong supporter of the Union and the retention of Fermanagh and Tyrone um, under the Union Jack. Um, the James Craig, of course, the key figure there. Um, he had been elected in 1906 to Westminster, uh, having been defeated in North Fermanagh in 1903. In those days, the land question was causing uh, major kind of tensions in Ireland. And uh, James Craig, on his first political outing, after his career as a captain in the, in the Boer War, um, saw him defeated by um, a, lib a sort of a land reform candidate called Edward Mitchell. Mitchell got the votes of the Methodist farmers and the Catholic farmers of North Fermanagh. And Craig was, you know, um, comprehensively defeated, but he returned to Parliament later on. So there's a Fermanagh connection you didn't quite uh, intend. Craig, of course, was to sign two parts with Michael Collins in 1922, about which we'll hear no more shortly. The next slide, please. Um, of course, one man, Collins and de Valera, had both been involved um, in the North before partition actually occurred. Here you have de Valera pictured with the Devlin family of Ard Bow in County Tyrone in 1918 during the East Tyrone by-election. De Valera is about um, 36 years old there. He's the president of Sinn Féin, um, and he will very shortly be renamed in 19. At 19, the president of the Irish. In this slide, he's with some other Sinn Féin delegates, but with the Devlin family, one of whom you'll know was Mary Devlin, who married Seamus Heaney. Next slide, please. And here you have the first Doyle. And of course, it was Doyle Aaron that would decide the terms of the treaty. De Valera was shocked when he realized that his particular idea of a republic associated with the empire had not been accepted and that the delegates had accepted not just partition to which de Valera was somewhat, uh, uh, if you like, um, accommodating himself, but also they had accepted dominion status rather than a republic. Um, the whole matter went to the Doyle for debate over the Christmas recess of December 1921 to January 1922. And of course, the treaty was only narrowly passed by 64 votes to 57. It could have gone either way, but during the Christmas recess, the Roman Catholic Church used its influence to a large uh, extent uh, to um, uh, influence opinion in favor of peace, as they call it. Cardinal Logue described the Anglo-Irish Treaty as, quote, this peace is God's gift. And that was echoed by churchmen up and down the country, including Protestant churchmen in the South, who, of course, wanted peace and stability after the long years of the War of Independence. Um, could we see the next slide, please? No, of course, the treaty, uh, you know, divided friends of the previous four years. De Valera talked about the, the split after four glorious years and the group of women members of the Doyle, Chuck the Doyle at TDs, led by Countess Markovich from a big house uh, aristocratic Protestant family in County Sligo from Lissadell. She led the charge against the treaty, um, accompanied by people like Mary McSweeney, whose, whose brother, the Lord Mayor of Cork, had died on a hunger strike in 1920. They saw the treaty as a betrayal of the martyred dead. And the poet William Butler Yeats talked about Macdonough's bony thumb being raised in the Doyle debates. In other words, the ghosts of the 1916 martyrs walked abroad and their names were invoked on both sides of the increasingly bitter treaty divide. The next slide, please. And here we have one man who actually opposed the treaty from the beginning, the Belfast-born engineer, Sean McEntee. McEntee had been sentenced to death for his part in the Easter Rising. Uh, he was then, of course, uh, his sentence was commuted. He was the TD for County Monaghan, but with very, very strong Northern connections. And he opposed the treaty on one ground. He said it would perpetuate partition. And he had no faith in the Boundary Commission, which he felt was um, a, a, an unworkable formula. And um, years, years later, as an old man in the 1980s, Sean McEntee said in a newspaper interview that if the treaty had been for all Ireland, if it had been an all Ireland free state um, that had been accepted, 
he would have supported the treaty. It was because of partition he rejected it. He was one of a small minority of about six members of the Doyle who spoke on the partition issue. Only six pages out of over 300 pages of debate in those three weeks was devoted to the North. Most people were concerned with sovereignty, the empire, and symbolic things like the oath of allegiance rather than the North. How do we explain that in the backward glance of the century? I think basically most members of the Doyle, including de Valera, were sold on the idea propagated by Collins and Griffith, that the Boundary Commission was designed by the British to force Irish unity by a process of contraction. In other words, it was going to hang a kind of a, a sword of Damocles over the heads of Craig and his government and force them by economic pressure and territorial erosion into a United Ireland. Now, the British hadn't actually thought in those terms. They needed to get the South to accept the treaty and this vague boundary commission was the only way. It was a formula that got things over the line. Its defects would become very clear in the aftermath of the treaty. The next slide, please. And here we have Michael Collins, of course. In some ways, he and Craig are at opposite ends of the spectrum. Collins, of course, who went to London as a young teenager to join the post office and then a bank, sworn into the secret Irish Republican Brotherhood, joining the Irish Volunteers, and of course, the, the cultural renaissance of the Gaelic League. He had returned to Ireland in 1916, reorganized the IRB and driven the War of Independence. Um, he was the architect of that success, I suppose, of the IRA campaign over three years in forcing the British to negotiate. But of course, he realized the limitations of the IRA, that they were down to their last few rounds of ammunition when the truce was called, and that negotiation was the only way forward. On the other hand, you had James Craig, um, the son of a wealthy distiller uh, in Belfast, um, a distinguished hero of the Boer War. Um, a, uh, a non-charismatic man, but nonetheless a shrewd political tactician who uh, had his uh, knees under the cabinet table in 1920 and 1921 as a junior minister, ensuring that um, steps were taken to ensure that partition would be effective. Setting up the Ulster Special Constabulary, for example, in 1920 was one of Craig's many demands. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, again, Michael Collins knew the North. He had been elected for a Northern seat like de Valera, um, not just in um, 1918, but in 1921, he was elected for Armagh, um, winning over 12,000 votes. And on the eve of the treaty negotiations in London, he had visited Armagh city to receive the freedom of the city. It had a nationalist council. And here you see um, Michael Collins with um, Ono Duffy, a prominent border IRA leader, close uh, associate of Collins and the IRB, and Eamon Donnelly, who was a, um, an Armagh man and a political organiser for Sinn Féin. And they're addressing a huge Sinn Féin meeting in Armagh City, 20,000 people, on the uh, 4th of September, 1921, when Collins reassured the Northern Nationalists that their concerns would not be forgotten in London. So Collins, uh, more than de Valera, he was concerned about partition. De Valera said he would never recognize it, but he had no strategy for ending it. Michael Collins said, we must combat the idea of partition in the Irish mind. And talking about the six counties, which became Northern Ireland, he said, all of that territory, Collins wrote in 1921, all of that territory must be redeemed for Ireland. So uh, the treaty divide doesn't explain it. You get hawks on the pro-treaty side like Collins, like O'Duffy, and uh, you get partitionists on the anti-treaty side. I mean, de Valera told the secret sessions of the Doyle um, in 1921 that if they could get a 26-county republic, he would let the other counties go under unionist rule. Now, that didn't come out for very many years. So uh, de Valera was much more of a crypto secret partitionist than Michael Collins, who was very secretly um, a, an ardent United Islander. The next slide, please. Collins, of course, had to fight for the treaty. You have these huge meetings in Dublin and throughout the South in which Collins and de Valera um, 
put their case to the electors. Now, of course, de Valera had said during the debates when he was forced to resign as president, uh, he said that um, they would find a constitutional way of resolving their differences. And there were hopes in January, February 1922, uh, as the free state was being established, that somehow a consensus would be formed and that there would be a sort of a loyal opposition around de Valera. But things quickly deteriorated because, of course, the IRA split, Common the Mon split, every major Republican organization in the country split on the question of the treaty. Families were divided. Neighborhoods were divided. Um, and the country began almost immediately to begin to slide towards civil war. And one of the arguments Collins used from the very beginning was that he said, if there was a split in the South, it would reinforce partition. Um, and he tried to use that to good effect. The next slide, please. Uh, of course, one man who was in the eye of the storm here was Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill had been associated with Irish affairs really from birth. As a young boy, he had visited his, uh, his cousins at Castle Leslie and County Monaghan, where Arma, Tyrone and Monaghan meet there, where Tyne and Abbey marches with Castle Leslie and Caledon Castle. And the one thing he noticed about the South Ulster landscape was the number of churches that dotted the crossroads. And Churchill, as a teenager, coined the famous phrase, the dreary steeples of Fermanagh and Tyrone. And I know I'm speaking to the converted, so I can say that tonight. But here you have Churchill, uh, who had uh, initially supported home rule at this famous meeting in Belfast in February 1912, when uh, chaired by Lord Perry, the managing director of Harland and Wolf, and the Protestant home ruler, Churchill had called for the reconciliation of races in Ireland and really gone against the policy of his famous loyalist father, Lord Randolph, who had said Ulster would fight in 1886. Now Churchill was colonial secretary in charge of Irish affairs. By this stage, 1922, he was much more of an ally of Craig. It was Churchill, for example, who had given the green light for the uh, Ulster specials in 1920, when Craig wanted the UVF formed into a, a private army to defend the new border. Churchill famously said, let's arm the Protestants. What he meant was to free up the police and military for action against the IRA in the south of Ireland. So Churchill, nonetheless, he hoped the treaty would settle the Irish question. And he wanted to reconcile Collins and Craig on the basis of the treaty. And so he plays a key role in the events on this island in 1922. It's hard to believe that, you know, some of us remember his funeral in 1965. Um, that his career was so long from the uh, 1880s to the 1960s. The next slide, please. But of course, James Craig is a key figure in all of this. James Craig, of course, we've talked about his background, but unlike Carson, who had headed up the unionist movement, Craig had a very Ulster-centric view of the constitutional question. Carson had wanted to use Ulster and its Protestant majority to save the Union for the whole of Ireland, to save his own people in the South and West, because Carson was a, a Dublin and Galway Unionist. But when Craig became leader in 1921, he had always had a vision of establishing a homeland for his own Protestant loyalist people in the northeast corner of Ireland. It mightn't be the whole province, it mightn't even be the six counties. That would depend on the way that things fell uh, in the critical years of the First World War. But of course, by 1920, he'd achieved his six counties under unionist dominated devolved government. He had his own separate police force, 32,000 special police, A, B and C, now massing on the borders and in nationalist cities like Derry, for example, in Enniskillen, uh, in Uri. Um, that was the only way Craig believed his homeland could be carved out in the teeth of massive nationalist opposition. Remember the uh, election pact of the Nationalist Party, and they were the moderate nationalists in 1921, had been partition means national suicide. So the Northern Nationalists wanted no part in Northern Ireland. Um, they had supported the idea for a united Ireland under its own parliament. And so Craig was going to have an uphill struggle reconciling that third of the population to his concept 
of a unionist state. Next slide, please. And of course, another key local figure who had a very long innings, um, Sir Basil Brooke, later Lord Brooke, uh, who was 20 years uh, Unionist Prime Minister from 1943 to 19, um, uh, 1963, when he was replaced by Terence O'Neill. Um, the story about Basil Brooke, of course, the, the joke against Basil Brooke was told by his um, successor, Terence O'Neill. Um, and O'Neill famously said that when you met Brooke in the 50s or early 60s, when he was prime minister, you always got the impression he was a very, very, very busy man, like the executive, chief executive of a big company who was taking a few minutes reluctantly away from his office desk. He was always on the brink, on nerves, you know, clasping his hands, couldn't wait to get away. The only thing O'Neill said when you got to know Brooke, there was no desk. Um, he was more interested in hunting, shooting and fishing and his Fermanagh estate. But in these key years, Brooke plays a part. Um, he was to the manor born. His family had landed from Chelsea uh, for, in the um, uh, 17th century and had built Donegal Castle after which they moved into Fermanagh and Cavan. He was related to Lord Alan Brooke, the great um, first, uh, you know, Br British British um, soldier. Um, he, of course, um, uh, went to um, Winchester Public School, then Sandhurst. Then he joined the Hussars and had a military career right up to the end of the First World War, briefly returning in 1912 to help to form Carson's army uh, on his Fermanagh estates at Colebrook. Uh, near Brookborough. Now, of course, Brook would return in um, 1918 at the end of the war, and he went to Dublin to visit a relative, Frank Brook, who was the uh, director of a railway company in Dublin. And uh, sadly, Frank Brook was assassinated by the IRA in his office at Westland Row Railway Station. And Brook returned to Fermanagh, determined to establish a loyalist force to defend the Protestant population. He called it for man of vigilance, but within a few months it had become absorbed into the new Ulster Special Constabulary. And Brooke's new role, as well as taking over his family estates, was, of course, to become County Commandant of the Specials. Um, uh, when the Specials arrived in Enniskillen in December 1920, they made a very bad impression on both sides of the community. And the Unionist business class, Brooke complained, shunned the Specials and discouraged their sons initially from joining it. And this was probably to do with the fact that when they arrived in Enniskillen, the specials from Belfast shot up the, the chapel, St. Michael's there in Enniskillen, they shot up the chapel and Brooke had to apologize for this and bring the specials more under control. So he was a border unionist who was determined to ensure that the six county border was maintained in these years. He was elected to the Senate in 1922, but didn't really begin as an MP to 1929. So his, his key years as prime minister were long um, into the future. The next slide, please. Now, of course, the Ulster Specials made a big difference. 32,000 strong by 1922. The, 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 the part-time um, B Specials, about 20,000 of those, were farmhands, were shipyard workers. And during the emergency of 1922, they were massed on the Irish border. So, for example, if you want to see evidence of that, in the 1923 register, there were 6,000 more um, uh, unionist voters than there had been before. And these were 6,000 specials from outside Fermanagh who had been drafted on, leading nationalist politicians to talk about a new plantation of Ulster um, in those early 1920s. The specials, of course, were um, hated, you might say, by the nationalist population because their aim was to suppress the IRA and to establish the territory of the new state. And uh, they were given really carte blanche um, uh, in, in towns like Enniskillen and uh, Oma uh, at this particular period. Um, and we see them here very, very much feature later on, of course, in the Battle of Pettigo uh, in the summer of 1922. Um, uh, mainly a working class organization, but with ex-World War aristocratic officers like Sir Basil Brooke in uh, Fermanagh, like General Ricardo um, and the Duke of Abercorn in County Tyrone. Next slide, please. And here you have the Fermanagh Sinn Féin leader in these years. This is Cahir Healy, uh, 
Um, he was a Donegal man born in the Duran Peninsula near Mount Charles, attending a mixed school in the area, arriving in Inniskillen um, at about the age of 20 as a young journalist on the Fermanagh Times. He married a local Protestant girl, uh, Catherine Cresswell, whose father was an officer in the Enniskillen Fusiliers. And um, he began life as a journalist, um, working mainly in Fermanagh, worked a bit in Roscommon and in Kerry even. Um, and then he came back to Fermanagh and, and he became the local agent for the Refuge Insurance Company, still writing poetry, um, poetry of the Gaelic Revival, becoming head of the GAA in the county. But his name when he arrived in Fermanagh was Charles Everard Healy. The Everards were Donegal landlords and his mother seems to have named him after the local landlord. But within a few years, Charles Everard Healy had Gaelicized his name to Cahar Healy. And uh, that's the name by which he was known during a long public career. Um, uh, as the head of the Refuge Insurance Company, he traveled for Manor and surrounding counties like Leitrim and Sligo and Donegal, uh, collecting, um, you know, uh, insurance. And that was a perfect cover for a man who from the early 20th century was a secret member of the IRB. Um, he may have been an intelligence officer for the IRA as well in the Midland Division, seems to have had a role there. And he was also, of course, by 1920, a Sinn Féin councillor and corporation and a member of Michael Collins's local advisory group. And in particular, Cahar Healy was involved in setting up Republican courts in the border areas of Fermanagh in 1920-22. So uh, he's a key figure. He will become a major figure in northern nationalism after partition. The next slide, please. Joe Devlin, of course, um, was to have a later Fermanagh connection because um, in 1929, he became one of the two Westminster MPs for Fermanagh to Rome. But Joe Devlin, from a working class family in Belfast, had become the northern leader of the Home Rule Party, a brilliant orator. He had uh, refunded the ancient order of Hibernians, which had its halls and its divisions all across the north, including Derry Lynn and Timor and Tempo in Fermanagh. And Devlin held sway uh, as one of John Redmond's deputies, and certainly was seen as the coming man as the future prime minister of a home rule parliament, much younger than his colleagues, much more aware of social and labor questions. He was the darling of the Belfast Mill Girls. And Devlin, of course, had been the major nationalist figure in Ulster before 1916. But the compromise that his party made in accepting temporary partition in 1916, denounced by a majority of nationalists west of the ban, especially in Fermanagh and Tyrone, meant that he was no longer flavor of the month. And they were looking to the new leaders people like Cahar Healy, but beyond them to Arthur Griffith and Michael Collins to speak for them um, as their interlocutors with the British government. But Devlin, of course, would find that despite his vast experience of previous negotiations, he was marginalised in 1922 because Collins was under pressure from Healy and others to keep the Devlinites who had um, assisted partition in 1914 and 1916 um, to keep them out of the loop and to deal only with Sinn Féin and its public representatives. And so Northern nationalism is divided at a time when Ulster unionism was never more united. I mean, you compare unionism in this election uh, for the Northern Ireland Assembly and you'll see it badly divided. But then you look back to 1921-22 and unionism was totally united. One unionist party People voted right down the party ticket, maximizing the number of seats. And the Orange Order, ensured by its powerful influence, which included the Prime Minister and Cabinet members, that it united the various social classes. Next slide, please. And here we have, of course, the result of uh, Churchill's intervention was he summoned Craig and Collins to London on the 21st of January, 1922. The treaty was a month old. And he brought them together and Churchill has left us account of the first meeting of these two giants from opposite ends of Ireland. The architect of partition versus the architect of the IRA campaign. That's basically what we're talking about. One man is uh, about 31, Michael Collins. James Craig, of course, was now in his early 50s. Um, one was from a wealthy dynastic business and military family. The other was from uh, a comfortable farming family in County Cork. 
who had spent long years as a clerk in London. I mean, that's the kind of, one was a member of a secret society, the Orange Order, another was a member of a secret society, the Irish Republic of Brotherhood. So they didn't have an awful lot in common unless they talked about secret societies. Um, and Churchill said when they first met, they glowered magnificently at each other as though they detested each other thoroughly. But he locked them in a room in the colonial office in London. And after about half 15 minutes, he heard some conversation. And it went on for a few hours. And at lunchtime, he sent in, according to Churchill's account, beer and mutton chops. Now, I think James Craig wasn't averse to a glass of whiskey because his father owned Dunville's distillery, but it was beer that Churchill sent in. And then he said he heard hearty laughter on the, on, on the all Ireland front. By the end of the day, they had signed an agreement, which, um, if you like, it was very significant and dissatisfied the Northern nationalists in particular. They agreed, first of all, that they would deal with the problems of the early 1920s. Something like eight to 10,000 Catholic workers had been expelled from their work in the shipyards and elsewhere. And uh, Craig said he would do his best to get them reinstated, although he acknowledged there was a world trade depression. Secondly, Colin said he would end the boycott of Belfast Goods and Belfast Banks, which the Doyle had adopted in 1921 in retaliation for the sectarian violence in Belfast. So they were each giving something to achieve something. Secondly, they said they would set aside the cumbrous machinery of the Boundary Commission in favour of a face-to-face uh, -face meeting between Craig and Collins or their uh, nominees who would decide the border. Collins thought this was a great achievement because he had excluded the English-nominated chairman. But for people at like Cahir George Murnahan, the Sinn Féin leader in Oma, Michael Lynch of the Ulster Herald, who was a leading Sinn Féiner in Oma, Collins had been hoodwinked by uh, Craig because, in their view, the neutral chairman would be essential for a successful boundary commission. And if it came down to an argy bargy between orange and green, then the free state was going to lose. That was the view of uh, Healy. And they began to criticize Collins and a movement got up of criticism on the ground. So the first part wasn't going well, although in, in Belfast, Craig was generally happy with the response of unionist businessmen. Many Belfast businesses, um, McGuire and Patterson, the, Mac fa the match factory, Barry Clare printers, local sub factories, local confectionery factories had been badly hit by the exclusion of their goods from the 26 counties over the previous two years. And they were going to the wall so that if they could trade again with uh, Ballin the Slow and, uh, you know, um, uh, Bandon, then, you know, this could be good for the all-Ireland economy. That was the hope. You'll notice that Archdale, the Fermanagh politician and landlord, is with Craig. He had come down specially to Dublin in February 1922 with Craig to meet Collins, but also to discuss the railway crisis. There was a railway strike at the time, and the Great Northern Railway crossed and recrossed the border. So it looked as though Craig and his cabinet were taking this first pact seriously. And this is Craig snapped as he enters the City Hall in Dublin at the gates of Dublin Castle and Dame Street. You can go there today, you can go into the City Hall, Daniel O'Connell, um, large statue there, Michael Collins was led out there in death. Um, and then you can go and visit Dublin Castle. This was the um, 2nd of February, 1922. The pact was going to break down because on the way down in the train, Collins read newspaper, Craig read newspaper reports that Collins was saying that he expected to get half the area of Northern Ireland under the Boundary Commission and that he told a border deputation that in demanding inclusion in the Free State, this to a Newry group, you're pushing an open door. Whereas Craig believed the Boundary Commission was about minor villages and townland, a kind of a dent and bulge rectification, not the handing over of whole counties. So they were at loggerheads right away. The pack broke down and Craig sailed from Dunlira, what was recently known as Kingstown, for a frenzied meeting with Lloyd George and the second meeting with Boner Law and a third meeting with Carson, because Craig feared that he had been betrayed by the British government. Nothing new there for unionist politicians, but this is 1922. The next slide, please. And of course, 
things very, very quickly take, take a violent step. What Churchill called a return to the hideous bog of reprisals. On the 11th of February, a train load of B-specials was making its way from Utenards, where they had been training um, as policemen, to Enniskillen, where they were going to take over the local um, RIC barracks. And in those days, of course, the Great Northern Railway went through County Monaghan. It was a very important line from, Bel from Belfast to Cavan. And instead of going um, through the north to Enniskillen, the train headed through County Monaghan to Enniskillen. And of course, the IRA in Clonus realised that a train load of B-specials were on their way. And they were waiting at the railway station. This is the old railway station in Clonus before they knocked it down. And they were just waiting on that platform when the specials steamed in, the old days of locomotives, glory be the days, that steamed into the station. And uh, of course, the local IRA commander, Matt Fitzpatrick from South Fermanagh, who had been at the nearby Crichton Hotel, arrived on the platform uh, with some of his men and ordered the specials to uh, leave the train and almost immediately a shot rang out. Fitzpatrick was shot dead and then the IRA opened fire and five specials were killed. A number were wounded. A number made their way up the railway line uh, a few hundred yards into County Fermanagh. But there was pandemonium at the station. It was known as the Clonus Ambush. Now, at the same time, mysterious raids occurred across the border. Parties of IRA crossed from uh, County Louth, Monaghan, Cavan, Leitrim, into Fermanagh, Tyrone and Armagh. And they kidnapped about 80 people, including the High Sheriff of County Tyrone, Anquetel Moutry and his son, the son of William Coote, a very ardent Unionist MP in uh, Ohr. Um, a number of these specials were kidnapped and they were all brought across the border and held in Free State Barracks, which had been evacuated by the British Army. Now, these raids had been orchestrated by a special Ulster Council of the IRA, and they had been given um, authorization by Michael Collins, even though he'd signed the treaty and just taken over Dublin Castle from the British. Owen O'Duffy and indeed Richard Mulcahy, who was at Minister of Defence, and the involved parties of the IRA. Uh, another concern they had was that a group of men uh, travelled from Monaghan. Uh, to Dromore and County Tyrone, going to a football match in the Maiden City. Uh, they became known as the Monaghan Footballers. They weren't really Monaghan Footballers. They were the 5th Northern Division staff of the IRA heading to Derry to try to um, uh, liberate a number of IRA prisoners who were being held on a death sentence in Derry Jail um, for the death of a prison warder who had been chloroformed and had died in an attempted escape. Um, unbeknownst to Collins, the British government intervened and the men were pardoned, but the raids had gone ahead. And uh, soon Craig was complaining about raids into his territory by the IRA, um, leading citizens having been arrested, and the bodies of the clone specials were being borne north. Um, all of this came as a match to a powder keg in Belfast, because Belfast in these years, 1920 to 22, saw the deaths of almost 500 people violently. Almost 60% were from a Catholic background, almost 40% from a Protestant background. Um, and this had been going on day on day from the summer of 1920 as snipers swept the streets and the IRA collided with specials. Um, the intensity of that violence and the brutality of that violence still beggars belief. So many women and small children were targeted by snipers. You have stories of gunmen going into houses, finding two elderly women, shooting both of them dead and then moving away. This happening in East and North Belfast regularly. I mean, I think if you compare the violence of the 1920s and the violence of our recent troubles, even some of the awful atrocities, I think, you know, even though fewer people died, some of the um, gothic events of the 1920s uh, beggar belief to this day. They really chill the blood. So that begins to happen in Belfast. The next slide, please. And here you can see a typical scene of mobs colliding in Royal Avenue in Belfast, the corner of Donegal Street, a local hotel there. This is just beside St. Anne's Cathedral. Um, and that was very typical. Violence would begin during the day and snipers would open fire. And then um, uh, shipyard trams would often be bombed by the IRA, Catholic churches bombed by loyalists, and so it went on in this bitter period. Next slide, please. And um, 
in reaction, of course, Collins had a number of IRA divisions in the North, which he had, uh, which supported his um, line on the treaty because he promised them military support. This is the third Northern Division in Belfast, which were actually became part of the Free State Army. Afterwards, on the left, you have a chartered accountant, Seamus Woods from County Down. Um, you have a railway clerk in the middle there, um, Tom McNally. You have Joe McKelvey, who has similar background as a clerk, and you have the, t the, the intelligence officer was a national teacher, Frank Crummy. And they have walked in out of the street into a Royal Avenue photographers during the truce to have their pictures taken. But all these men and their 700 men in the 3rd Northern Division, centred in Belfast, became active under Collins's orders during 1922. In Tyrone, you had the 2nd Northern Division, led by a World War I officer, Major Morris. He had been, um, he had been uh, gazetted on the battlefield for valour, and he kept his British title as an IRA commander in Tyrone, who had Frank Aiken and South Armagh. And so there were about 4,000 active IRA in the North, during this period that Collins could um, activate at any time. The next slide, please. And of course, this is a, a letter from James Craig. It actually turned up unusually as the backing for a Sacred Heart picture in a Catholic home some time ago. You may have seen that in the news. And uh, when the Sacred Heart picture accidentally fell, a letter signed by James Craig from 1922, praising the Beast Specials fell out of the bed. Now, if that's not a miracle, I don't know what is. The next slide, please. Uh, and of course, um, the worst scenes of violence in Belfast in this period included the Weaver Street killings, in which a group of um, little girls, 11, 12, swinging at lampposts at Weaver Street in North Belfast, a nationalist area, were the subject of a bombing. Six of them were killed and two of their mothers were killed when they went to help them. They were killed by snipers, known as the Weaver Street Atrocity. And it was followed by the, the murder of a Protestant family in Millfield by obviously Republicans. Violence was ratcheting up in response to the border campaign. And in March, the IRA split and the Irregulars, the anti-treaty arts under Rory O'Connor, uh, sees the four courts in central Dublin. Here you have them marching up Grafton Street, defying Michael Collins, the British government, and the treaty. The next slide, please. Common the Man, the women's organisation, which included people like, for example, um, the mother of Gareth Fitzgerald, Mabel McConnell, as she was, a Belfast Presbyterian, which included, of course, um, you know, a lot of prominent women of the period, um, um, uh, split badly um, for and against the treaty as well. Every organization uh, generated by 1916 was to split irreparably. The next slide, please. And of course, in Belfast, you have a menacing scene here in May Street behind the City Hall. Two B specials have just been shot dead by the IRA. The date is the 23rd of March. It's lunchtime. The day is still young. And you can see this typical cage car that the specials used as motorized transport on the border. Until this period, IRA killings of police and military in Belfast had been repaired by reprisals after curfew by the forces of the Crown. This had been the policy all over Ireland, authorized by Lord George and Churchill up to the truce of 1921. The next slide, please. That night, um, the house of Owen McMahon, a wealthy Catholic publican who owned a chain of public houses in the city centre, who had no interest in politics. He was a Catholic, uh, but he was also a director of Glen Torren Football Club. And uh, his house was broken into by um, unknown uniformed men um, at 1.30 in the morning. The women folk were locked in a room. The men lined up against the wall. Owen McMahon Four of his uh, uh, five sons and a barman were actually um, uh, murdered in their own. This is them led out in the morgue afterwards. The McMahon murders chilled the blood of people across the, uh, the island of Ireland. And of course, it really worried Churchill, who told his cabinet committee next day, these men may have been murdered by specials. Almost certainly were. Almost certainly this reprisal involved a senior member of the RIC in Belfast, County Cavanborn District Inspector John Nixon. Um, um, 
the culprits were never brought to book and you had the huge McMahon murders following um, speeches in the House of Commons. Churchill decided something would have to be done to stop the violence on the border and in Belfast. And he summoned Craig and his cabinet and Collins and his cabinet once more to London on the 30th of March, 1922. Next slide, please. And this resulted in the second Craig Collins plot, much more detailed. This time it attempted to reform the police. Uh, it proposed a Catholic committee uh, appointed by the local Catholic bishop to nominate um, Catholic specials to defend uh, the Falls Road and other nationalist areas. It proposed a conciliation committee. The British government offered half a million pounds for relief works on both sides. Um, um, and uh, uh, the House of Commons rejoiced in peace in Ireland. The terms had been drawn up by a couple of Belfast businessmen who were very close to Joe Devlin. But of course, it only dealt with the symptoms of the violence. It didn't deal with its, its taproots. And almost immediately, the second Craig Collins pack was washed away in a sea of blood. The next slide, please. The streets of Catholic homes were burnt in Belfast. This is the Marrowbone in North Belfast in this period. Um, I've been reading uh, an account of a local priest who had officiated the, the McMahon murders, and he's writing to the London Times exactly 100 years ago on this day, saying that even on a sweet April day, I can feel the uh, exhalations of black smoke from streets of houses burnt by um, howling mobs in Belfast. So this is a shocking period in Belfast. Some weeks, 70, 80 people are killed. Next slide, please. And moving on, the descent into chaos continues. The McMahon murders were followed by uh, the murder. Uh, another policeman is killed. And then there's more retaliation amongst the nationalist population by police and specials. Uh, next slide, please. The so-called Arnon Street murders. It's around this time that Collins authorized uh, an insurrection in the North, uh, coordinated by a number of IRA figures, including Owen O'Duffy, um, who was, like Collins, a member of the secret IRB. Now, the thing you have to remember is that Collins's cabinet, the provisional government, who had signed the oath, didn't really know of this twin-track policy he was pursuing, uh, because he, he'd upheld the treaty on the one hand. People like Owen McNeil, Minister of Education from Glenarm, people like Kevin O'Higgins, people like Ernest Blythe, a Protestant from Lisburn, uh, who was Minister of um, um, Home Affairs, they didn't realize that Collins was secretly still involved in defending Catholics in the North as he saw it. And he had planned a Northern insurrection to take off in May 1922. Next slide, please. And of course, as the IRA is splitting, there are attempts to reunite the army officers on both sides, like Collins and Liam Lynch. The next slide, please. And we're moving very rapidly, of course. That insurrection had been planned um, for um, uh, May 1922. In the end, somebody must have cancelled the order in Dublin, but the cancelled order didn't get as far as Antrim down in Tehran, where IRA activity took place. Belfast Police Headquarters was um, attacked and invaded uh, by the IRA, 20 men dressed as police who almost succeeded in removing armoured cars. Um, you had uh, attacks on barracks in Tyrone and South Derry, stroke London Derry. You had uh, the burning of Shane's Castle in County Antrim. Railways were being disrupted, all of that. Collins's advisory committee included people like George Murnahan from Oma and Cahar Healy from Fermanagh. And uh, he was getting mixed reports from them because they, they feared that violence would only beget violence. And they were focusing on the Boundary Commission, which seemed to be a pipe dream now in the midst of all this violence. In March, Sir Henry Wilson, a County Longford Unionist, a former Chief of the British General Staff, a strong supporter of Carson of the UVF, he had not only become MP for North Don, a Unionist MP at Westminster, but he became Craig's military advisor. And he was advising Craig on security policy. And of course, Collins secretly gave the order for his assassination by the London IRA. And Wilson would be assassinated, of course, um, in June 1922, precipitating the civil war. But at this stage, that doesn't happen to the end of June. 
Um, next slide, please. And of course, um, a unionist MP was shot dead in Royal Avenue in May by the IRA. The unionist government responded with internment, but 500 Republican suspects were rounded up, including, for example, uh, Michael McCartan of Vet and Oma, Carol Healy from Fermanagh, um, a host of doctors and professional men, Dr. James Gillespie from Cookstown, who was a medical doctor and a coroner, um, um, then Tom. Um, uh, the, the head of uh, Fermanagh County Council, uh, Tom Corrigan, many others were arrested and put on a converted a Canadian cargo ship on Belfast Lock called the Argenta. Uh, this is a, a book by um, a, an American historian called Denise Klein Rickard on the experience of the Argenta, which remained um, in the lock for two years. The next, uh, the next slide, please. And here's the Argento again. By the end, 700 of exclusively Republican suspects were interned under the new Special Powers Act passed by the, the Belfast government, from which, of course, nationalists and Republicans were abstaining in protest. The next slide, please. It's at this time, of course, at the end of May, that the trouble on the, on the border was escalating. Collins had tried to arm Northern IRA units with old guns from the War of Independence. Um, he was now burning the candle very much at both ends. And as the IRA massed on the Leitrim and Donegal border, um, the villages of Balik and Pettigo were invaded by the IRA. And Pe um, Pettigo was mainly in Donegal, part of it in the north, known as Tully Hammond. Balik was, of course, exclusively in the north, but in those days, the road from Enniskillen to Balik ran largely through County Donegal along the uh, north side of Loch Erne. So the roads were very different then to now. Churchill heard that the IRA had invaded. Craig was bitterly complaining about further raids and he decided to send in the artillery, something Lord George wasn't keen on. Lord George was frightened that this would unite the IRA in the south and destroy the treaty. So it's all happening now on the fermanagh Donegal border in this area, Balik, Lahi, Petigo. Um, um, uh, next slide, please. And here we have Belique Port Fort. The IRA were massed in Belique Fort, which was just inside County Donegal, an ancient earthwork. Um, the British arrived with howitzer guns and they began to fire. Seven IRA men were killed. They were forced to retreat. And the result is, of course, the British take over the fort and they hold it really until 1924. Then there was the problem of Pettigo. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, sort of a nebulous figure in this period is this lady, Mrs. Hazel Laverton. She had been married into the Johnson family of Maharamina Castle uh, on Loch Erne on the outskirts of Belief. But uh, he, she and her husband had divorced during the First World War. She was now living in the Royal Hotel in Enniskillen. She was a bit of an Amazon, this woman. I mean, she had a large boat, a pleasure cruiser, um, and she was known as the Lady of the Lake. And she used her boat, um, the Pandora, to ferry B specials from the Fermanagh side of the lock over to the Donegal side for the Battle of the Lake, over to Maharamina Castle. And she's very, very active in the lake during this period. This is a posed photograph, but we also have a, a movie, a piece of movie film made about this that some of you may have seen in my pre previous um, uh, lectures for the council. So you can see it's all happening there in the last days of June, uh, last days of May, early days of June. There was a real danger this could light the uh, blue touch paper of civil war, but a different civil war, a north-south civil war, with all the sectarian uh, implications of that. The next slide, please. And this is Maharamina Castle in happier times. It was taken over by the specials. By, by this stage, it was occupied by Father Lorcan O'Kieran, a Gaelic-speaking parish priest, and it had been used for secret Republican courts. He was evicted by the specials, then the IRA took it over again. An awful lot happening. And in the film footage, I can't show you that, but Basil Brooke, the commander of the specials in Dramat, arrives in Mufti with the British as they advance into Donegal. Now, Lloyd George wasn't happy with this, and probably if we had the kind of immediate communication we have today with mobile phones and Twitter, 
Um, this could have sparked a civil war. It could have united the IRA and the four courts with the IRA under Collins' control. But news traveled slowly, and while Collins protested against it, it was soon overtaken by other events, as we know often happened in the troubles we all experienced. And Maharamina Castle is st still standing in ruins. If you're ever in that area around Balik and the Donegal border, pay it a visit. You'll see a grand old mansion with a storied history. The next slide, please. And of course, this is the British massing towards County Donegal, bringing in their howitzer guns. The movie footage is like a scene from the Western Front. Lord George was very angry and he told Churchill, we mustn't get bogged down in the swamps of Loch Erne. We must stay on the high ground of crown and empire or we're going to lose the confidence of the free state. That was his view. But Craig knew from this that he was being supported big time by the British government and had a strong supporter in Winston Churchill, the former home ruler. Next slide. This is one of the abandoned cars of the B-Specials found in Pettigo, uh, captured by the IRA, known as the Holy Terror. The next slide, please. Henry Wilson, of course, his assassination by London IRA men on the 22nd of June was to trigger the civil war. The British government knew that Collins had not been playing straight with them. They knew he had this twin track approach to the North. He was paying the salaries of Catholic teachers. He was backing the Northern IRA, and yet he was upholding the treaty and had taken an oath of allegiance. But the British decided to blame Rory O'Connor and the IRA garrison several hundred strong in the four courts in Dublin who had said that they would do anything to prevent the treaty becoming a fact. And so the British put pressure on Collins to besiege the four courts, to shell the four courts. Next slide, please. Uh, Wilson was just being buried, um, County Longford Unionist, um, and suddenly with guns borrowed from the British, the National Army under Collins control began to shell a building which had been the law courts where Wolf Tone had practiced, where John Redmond had practiced, and where Edward Carson had practiced. It also held the public records relating to us all. And in the fire that destroyed most of those records, many of us and our ancestors were effectively illegitimized, the great loss of the archives, pipe rolls from the Middle Ages, and birth uh, records from the 19th century, all destroyed. The garrison quickly surrendered, the fighting spread to Dublin, um, and of course, eventually, it moved south. And Munster, Michael Collins' native province, became the, the focus for this civil war between uh, Collins and the National Army, um, all of the Northern IRA men, including Charlie Hawley's father from Swaffa, including IRA men from Oma and John Quinn, uh, and Enniskillen were all fighting in the South in the Civil War. Many of them pursued careers in the Irish Free State Army. The next slide, please. And there we have, captured by the Belfast artist, Sir John Lavery, who with his beautiful wife, Lady Hazel Lavery, you may have got a talk by that very recently by Dr. Siobhan, uh, Dr. Sinead McCool. Um, you can see that in the City Hall in Dublin, as Collins lay in state, and um, fell by a ricochet bullet in an ambush in his native county Cork at Bairn the Blah during the Civil War in August. And Lavery captured him there. In many ways, he was the end of Ireland's hopes. His death, of course, made the Civil War more bitter. Emergency laws were brought in, atrocities occurred. It ran on for another year. It was de Valera's darkest hour, a foot soldier on the run. It wasn't until April when he persuaded the northerner, Frank Aiken, to um, uh, end the campaign of the Civil War came to an end and Dev would spend, like many others, a long year in a Dublin prison. And uh, it meant that the South was now bitterly divided and an uneasy peace began to descend on the North with a huge uh, contingent of B-specials on the borders of Fermanagh and Tyrone and in the city of Belfast. And indeed, martial law curfew would not be lifted for another year as the two Irish states settled on uh, both of them bitterly divided um, with minorities that rejected the authority of Craig in the North and the Free State Government, now led by William Cosgrave in the South, um, poles apart on the Irish border. Thank you very much.